Our guest this weekend is our old friend, Dr. Yuri Maltsev, a senior fellow here at the Mises Institute and a professor of economics at Carthage College in Kenosha, Wisconsin. Of course, Yuri is famous for having been a Soviet economist during the Gorbachev era and defecting to the United States. Yuri's here to talk to us about Trumpism, about the Bernie Sanders phenomenon, and Western progressive silly and enduring love affair with socialism, and what those often misused terms themselves, socialism and fascism, really mean. Stay tuned for a great interview with Yuri Maltsev. Well, Dr. Yuri Maltsev, welcome back. It's great to talk to you once again on Mises Weekends. It's really nice to be back. The last time we spoke, which is about a year and a half ago now, we talked about this silly sort of enduring romance that Westerners and Americans in particular continue to have with socialism. Now, since then, we've seen the rise of the Bernie Sanders phenomenon. So I'd, I'd love to get your thoughts on Bernie and, and the crowds he's, uh, he's having and, uh, and the impact he's making. Yes, it's very sad to see that right now the United States is kind of facing a choice between, I would say, socialism and national socialism. So it's uh, we have candidates of both parties who are attracting the most active part of population, uh, either Marxist-Leninists like Bernie Sanders, uh, not many people realize that 15 years ago he published an article in which he demanded 100% tax on incomes above $1 million. So he is, in that case, he is very close to to the ideas of um, Mr. Obama's father, uh, uh, Barack Obama Sr., who also suggested in 1965 that that the state should should um, uh, impose a 100% of tax on everybody, however, providing people with everything they need. Mr. Sanders, he looks kind of benevolent, but from another hand, with the ideas that he has, uh, definitely, uh, these ideas can only result in destruction of our economy, culture, and uh, in the future, in mass murder. Uh, the Christmas Eve day is an anniversary; will, will be an anniversary of the of the dissolution of the Soviet Union. And Soviet Union is a very good example of the country which was glued together only by fear, because ideas of Bernie Sanders were exactly the same ideas which ruined the Soviet Union. Um, if you will impose uh, socialism on any country, you're completely destroying any incentives to work, any incentives to do anything. So then you need to apply violence and mass murder to make people to do what you want them to do. And no matter whether you are looking nice uh, like Mr. Saunders or or like um, um, looking pretty bright like our president does, then the logic of that system would turn you into a mass murderer. First Soviet government was the government of intellectuals. They have um, uh, people like Trotsky who would write poetry in French. Uh, Lenin could speak seven languages and could play piano um, very well. Uh, all others were also very prominent, prominent scholars and philosophers in their field. But then the logic of that system, which does not have any incentives, turned them all into mass murderers and serial political killers. Well, it's interesting. You know, as libertarians, we look at socialism and communism as force. We look at them as systems that inevitably lead to death and destruction and violence. But our progressive friends don't see it that way, right? They would say, well, look at Norway, Dr. Maltsev, look at Sweden. You know, these are not necessarily violent authoritarian regimes. And gee whiz, in those contexts, socialism can work. Yes. Well, I, I think that von Mises, uh, he put it very right. He said socialism is not an economic system. It is a revolt against economics. Uh, socialism is a simple system of commands, simple system of management. If you will look, however, at Norway and Sweden, you would not find uh, that they are socialist countries. I would say Sweden today is probably economically more free than the United States. Because what is socialism? Socialism means government, government ownership. Uh, any government is a socialist institution. So. From that perspective, the smaller the government, the better it is, the less socialism we have. And if you will look at, say, Sweden, then government ownership is very small. 
regul regulatory mechanism is much smaller than we have in the United States. So that's and besides that, these are these are uh, I mean Sweden and Norway. These are countries probably the size of a little bit more than Wisconsin, maybe Wisconsin and Iowa combined and whatnot. Uh, this uh, and and they were until recently they were kind of ethnically and religiously homogeneous communities. And and so these are not examples that it would work. If you will look uh, in Denmark, for example, Bernie Sanders all the time would refer to Denmark as a socialist paradise. And the prime minister of Denmark recently, he, yeah, he, blasted, uh, he blasted Sanders saying that just don't bad mouth us. We are not socialists. We are a free market economy. It's interesting. You bring up the regulatory burden. In the U.S., we tend to think of socialism only in terms of, of mass redistribution of wealth, right? People in the U.S., especially people on the left, don't see the regulatory state as at least socialist, if not completely socialist. Regulatory mechanism is, is the same socialism as the nationalization of property. I mean, if you will look at, at the national socialism regime and Nazi regime in Germany, uh, that was that was a regulatory state, which still was kind of um, acknowledged property rights, but these property rights were phony. These property rights would be the same as you have property rights, say, on wetlands in the United States. So the government would tell you when to open, when to close, whom to hire, whom to fire. Everything was in place. Lenin himself, Lenin was, I would say, kind of pleasantly surprised that his revolution was so quick and he achieved everything in one fell swoop. Because before that, he thought that it will be a long process. And at first, he said, we should, we should impose regulations so capitalists would do what we want them to do for us. Well, having having lived in the former Soviet Union and come to America, give me your thoughts on the current state of the American right wing, and and in particular, what do you think of Trumpism? Trumpism, yes, Trumpism. I think that this is the same kind of phenomenon that we had in Europe in nineteen twenties and nineteen thirties. It is a it is a reaction, and I would say predictable reaction against against uh, the wildly radically socialist agenda of Obama administration. Um, and there's um, people are just scared. And when people are scared, then, then anyone who is promising them everything um, is doing very well. Um, I would say that Trump definitely, he's, uh, I mean, I, I don't see him um, having any chances except putting Hillary in place in the White House. Um, but from another hand, it's very troubling from another hand uh, phenomenon because Trump is not a friend of liberty. He is not a, uh, he's not a constitutionalist. Uh, his, uh, his major ideas are unknown to, to, to me. Uh, he is just playing on, on people's fears. Uh, but people do, they do have these pretty legitimate fears, especially if you will look at immigration. I am an immigrant myself. I am all for, for free immigration. However, immigration today is completely different than it was before. Now, immigration is a huge welfare program which is run by the federal government with a bill of several billion dollars a year. So it's not that this hurled masses, wretched masses uh, from overseas who were prosecuted are trying to get into the United States. No, the, the people are being picked up according to the standards of social, ethnic, political engineering of the federal government, and brought here at your expense. And, for example, Tsarnaev brothers, who bombed Boston Marathon, uh, these people, uh, uh, they consumed about 120,000 U.S. dollars in all kinds of welfare schemes to kill people who paid for them uh, at this this tragic event in Boston. Uh, so if you will remember history of the United States, many, many, many people from Britain came to the United States as endangered slaves even, endangered servants. So they were, yes, so they incurred a lot of costs themselves. That was their choice. Today, if we are going there and picking up whom we want and bringing them here just to dilute people that Mr. Obama doesn't like, 
uh, I think that this is a travesty. And Mr. Trump, he is making this point, and that's why people do support him. Well, turning back for a moment to Sanders, it's not just young people and millennials or Occupy Wall Street types at Israelis. We see older, you know, baby boomers with ponytails too. It is is America just so rich? That even people who ought to know better, people who are in their fifties and sixties, they, they've just never experienced what socialism or what or what hardship or what a planned economy is like, and thus they they don't get what they're really advocating. Jeff, I hate to say that, but I think that even the the demise of the Soviet Union contributed to that. Soviet Union was kind of like a village drunk or village idiot, and people would look at that and see, no, socialism does not work. It's impossible that in the country, which is spreading to 11 time zones, people cannot find bread or butter or other things that we enjoy in the United States. Today it's gone. Today nobody can point anywhere. And then this old social envy, old socialist ideas, they are coming back. And Bernie Sanders, if uh, not many people, at least not our mass media, is telling us that Bernie Sanders, not only he is a socialist, he is also a national socialist. To that extent, he can be very well compared to Mr. Trump because because Bernie Sanders, if you remember, he was trashing Koch brothers and everybody else on the right for the free... Uh, borders concept. His point was that these this are these greedy capitalists who want to bring people to exploit them in the United States. And no, 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 like that. And so he is, uh, he is also, he is, he's very bad news. Uh, but I'm also, uh, maybe I'm wrong, hopefully I'm wrong, uh, but I think that he has only one role in this, in this campaign is to provide a good background for Mrs. Clinton. Do people ever truly change their minds? In other words, if I went to the former Soviet Union today, let's say I went to Moscow, and I found some people who are 80 or 90 years old, wouldn't, would, would, wouldn't some of them say, despite all the evidence to the contrary, that the collectivism works and, and that the old system was better and that they don't believe in free markets and capitalism, even today? Jeff, you wouldn't believe it. I, when I was last time in Cuba, I met some professors from University of Montana who would be looking at all this man-made disaster, which is Cuba, and they would say, isn't it beautiful? There are so many intellectuals who would go to Soviet Union today, to Russia today, and they would visit these memorials of these death concentration camps where people were exterminated by millions, and they would say, no, this is not true. Or they would just would not say anything but return back and would praise socialism again. Sure, there's a lot of people, older people, who would, it's kind of human nature. I remember I spent one month in the Soviet army, and I wasn't thinking that I would survive that month. It was the most horrible month in my life at that time, as I remember it. From my perspective today, it was it was kind of fun. It was interesting experience, which is over me. And many older people in the Soviet Union, because their youth was was I would say wasted by the socialist regime. But that's the only thing they knew at that time. They some of them they remember it fondly, and that's why they embrace people who are promising them something for nothing, uh, the same way as people do embrace this kind of promises in the United States, unfortunately. Well, if you look at today's government in Russia, you know, it's it's no longer communist. How would you describe it? Would you say it's oligarchic? How would you describe Putin's government? Again, von Mises, he provided us with a great insight. He said there are two patterns of socialism. One is German pattern in which, um, in which all the entrepreneurs, all the owners become just managers for the government. And there is a Soviet pattern where the whole country is run like a post office general, run by postmaster. So then everything is owned by the state. So they got rid of this Soviet pattern. But I think that today's government embraced this German pattern because there's no free market. It's a huge regulatory state. It's a huge kind of place some people call it crony capitalism. I think crony capitalism is an oxymoron. There's no such thing. It's a crony socialism. And this is a crony socialism when 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 the people around the throne, around Mr. Putin, uh, people who are his his friends, his buddies, and loyal to him, they're enjoying unbelievable 
standard of living, unheard of in Russia, unheard of even under Tsars. Uh, so this is the this is very far from being free market. Having said that, however, I believe that even German pattern is much better than Soviet pattern because even ordinary Russians enjoy today much higher standard of living than they did under communism. So it's still an improvement in a sense. It is. It is. Yeah, because they, I would say, under Gorbachev, they reached absolute bottom. There was no way to go lower. When you worked as an economist in Russia, uh, and Gorbachev was president by the, you know, before you had left, correct? Mm -hmm. You spoke in our last interview about having read The Road to Serve. Did anyone in Russia uh, at the highest levels in politics and economics, I mean, were people reading Mises and Hayek? Uh, were they aware of them? I mean, did they, did they have some understanding of what we would call Austrian economics? Well, I would say that the, the people like me um, and people, I would say, some, somewhere like in the middle of this pyramid, were very interested, intellectuals, very interested in exploring von Mises and exploring Hayek and exploring Ayn Rand and exploring all ideas of freedom of George Orwell, Solzhenitsyn, whomever they could find. From another hand, people on the very top, like Mr. Gorbachev, I don't think that he, he ever read uh, he ever read or uh, wrote a survey or was even interested in doing that. And that was the funniest thing I heard from him, uh, that uh, we had um, the, uh, the chief economic advisor, the advisor to Gorbachev, was Abela Gunbegian. Um, and uh, Abela Gunbegian, the biggest economist in the world, we called him because he was maybe 500 pounds. And he, um, he, used, to, he used to say all the time that what we need now is to build Swedish, Swedish model of socialism. And Gorbachev, when he heard that the second time, he said, Abel, where would you get all the Swedes? And that was, <laughs> that was exactly right. So these people didn't know. I mean, most people thought that still socialism is good, it's just Stalin is bad, that the gulag is bad, that murdering people in the middle of the night is bad. But, uh, but there's this wonderful wonderful image of, of socialism, um, which I think Mr. Obama is sharing. Um, Mr. I think that Mr. Sanders is uh, way to the left of him, Mr. Obama. I think, uh, I think if, if Mr. Obama we can qualify as kind of a Marxist, then uh, Mr. Sanders is a true Leninist. We only have time for one last question. Let me ask you this. You've lived in a, in a former Soviet Union. You've taught in America. You've been all around the world. Do you think one's inclination to be collectivist in outlook or libertarian in outlook, do you think that's nature or nurture? Do you think there's potentially a, a genetic component that leads us to be more libertarian or more statist? I would say that it, it is social rather than biological in a sense that, that I think that educational system that we have in the United States, the uh, the culture elites, they are promoting collectivism. Uh, if you will look what public schools, what universities are doing, if you will look at whatever predominant culture, the culture is that we are responsible for all the bad things in the world. People, who, a lot of my students, they feel guilty for no reason. And this is, this is very sad because collectivists are exploiting this. And very sad for me to... Uh, to, to, to see that because I, I am too old already to, to defect again. Now, we'll have to keep you right here where you are, Yuri. Dr. Yuri Maltsev, thank you so much for your time and a great interview. Ladies and gentlemen, have a great weekend.